Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we are reviewing Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard by Chip and Dan Heath, the New York Times number one best hole. Nice. <laughs> Mate, I reckon this was a bloody good book. Yeah. Uh, really well structured, uh, really clear. They've borrowed a lot of things from other great books that we've read um, and a lot of other big authors and stuff, but they packaged it really well, I thought. Yeah. Mate, yeah, I agree. It's absolutely... An absolute five star on, on how to change, not just for yourself, but if you're trying to get others to change as well, because it can be fucking hard, especially others, because it, it obviously is much easier just to stick in your comfort zone and, and do the status quo sometimes. Yeah, definitely. And so in terms of the structure, there's three uh, elements that they talk about using a, um, I guess a story from another book, hmm. uh, and he talks about the rider and the elephant and the path. So they're the three things, the rider, the elephant, and the path. Yep. That's right. So, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. So, we'll get straight into it, yeah? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Chapter one is the, the three surprising things about change. So, mm. you know, a lot of people say people resist change and it's not quite that easy, but we're always facing change. So, when babies are born every day, parents are always welcoming change just because they have to. So, the book is says that successful change... Uh, happens and it yep. all shares a, a common pattern as well. So the book tries to dissect these common patterns that are in change. Yeah, that's it. He says that you know there's books that are specifically focused on you know maybe organisational change or there's books that focus specifically on individual change, like a specific you know quitting smoking or something. But he's saying that this book is just about change in general and change is similar across all those domains. He reckons. Yeah, they reckon. Yeah. So, as, as you briefly mentioned, man, there's a tension always between the emotional side and the rational side when you try and try and change something. So it's kind of like we're uh, schizophrenic. So say if you want to get up earlier and start jogging in the morning, yep. there's the rational side. You want to get up at five forty-five because you want to get fit, but then the other part wakes up and it's the emotional side, and you want to cocoon in the sheets yeah. and stay in the in the warmth. So yeah, there's exactly. two parts of you trying to pull you in different directions, and that's where he says you got. That's where he brings in the elephant and then the rider into the story. Yeah, that's it. So the rider is that rational side that thinks and that knows that, you know, if I go get up now and go for a run, it'll pay off in the future. Whereas the elephant is the emotional side. And the elephant thinks it's cold out. I don't want to get up. I'd rather have another half an hour of snoozing. Yep. And yep. Yeah. So the rider can hold the reins of the elephant and can guide it for a little bit, uh, but only for so long until it gets, you know, a bit weak and that big fat... Strong elephant takes over yeah. control. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, you, 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 your rider's only got so much control until mm. the elephant has got all the, the really, it has the big say in everything, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, if you reach the rider but not the elephant, then uh, team members will have an understanding without motivation. Yeah. But if you reach the elephant, the elephant but not the rider, they'll have passion without direction. Nice. So, you need both of them on board to, to yep. get going. Yeah, fantastic. And so, some of the issues that they say around change is sometimes what looks like laziness is often exhaustion and that's because um, you need to, like the rider is exhausted, can't control the elephant anymore. And he said sometimes what looks like resistance is often a lack of clarity and that you need to give a clear direction. Mm. And what was the third one? Oh, oh yeah. The third one, the third one was <laughs> to change someone's behavior, you have to change that person's situation. Yeah. Yeah. So they say there's a, with, sometimes what you think is a people problem is often a situation problem. Yeah. And that, he talks about self-control being an exhaustible resource, which mm. is a concept taken from another book. Yeah, the book Paradox of Choice, which we'll have to do at some point. Good book. Yep. Saying that almost like within each day, you've got a fixed amount of self-control or willpower. Uh, was this where he talked about the cookies story? Yeah, so we're probably going to cook this story. But yeah. <laughs> to do with the, the kids, some kids were offered radishes, which were horrible Yeah. Uh, or horrible tasting things, and then some yep. were offered cookies and, t and and said they can't eat them, but they had to sit in front of them yep. or something. So the kids who sat in front of the cookies and had to have all this self control not to eat the cookies were given a test after or yep. something like that, and then yeah, struggled. yeah. So the ones that that controlled themselves and didn't eat the cookies, they did the test after, and they did it for like. 11 minutes or something, working at it until they gave up on this problem. Whereas the ones who gave into that self-control and ate the cookies worked at this problem for like 20 minutes because they hadn't exhausted their self-control, so they were able to use that self-control in focusing on the task. Yeah. 
Um, so he was just saying that, you know, it's a finite resource. It's exhaustible. You, you've only got a certain amount of self-control to use each day. Yep, fucking good stuff. You saved that one. So there's, yeah, there's three parts of the book. Direct the rider, motivate the elephant, and shape the path. So part one is yep. direct the rider. Nice. And one of the first uh, ways that we can direct the rider is to find the bright spots. Because the issue is that the rider largely ignores the positive things and quickly snaps into action when they see a, like a problem or a negative thing that they can try and fix straight away. But that's probably not the best way to do it because then we're always focusing problems. Mm. We need to find a bright spot, which is like a successful effort that's worth emulating. Yep, so a good example he has in the story here is of a dude called Jerry Stern. So he worked for an organisation called Save the Children and he was tasked to set up shop in Vietnam. So the government invited them in to fight malnutrition, but they had a very limited budget. So what he did is he quickly did a big test and, and study to see... Uh, so he got all the mothers to weigh all the children in the villages and then mm-hmm. to see what was, what was happening and what was up and, and if any actually were healthy. Yeah, and so there was basically there was this big malnutrition problem, but they found that there was a certain. They asked the parents, you know, is there anyone who's like got big kids, like compared to all these other small kids, is there anyone doing well? And they found this certain area or whatever of uh, a group of people that had much healthier kids. Yeah, and so rather than this big, uh, big dog save the children from America, like yeah, we know best. We know how to. Uh, best feed kids. We're going to show you guys exactly how you should feed them like an American kid. Instead, this Jerry dude went out to find the bright spot of these healthy kids and what were these parents, what were these mothers doing better than everybody else? Yeah, so what were they doing right? So the the other way people would, I guess, traditionally go in is say, what are the problems? And they go, oh yeah, the food and the sanitation. Yeah. So it'd be a big effort to, to feed everyone up to, say, the US standards and yeah. get all the fresh water pumped in through all the infrastructure. So yeah, he went in and asked, what are they doing right? And it turns out these, they, some of the parents with kids who were kind of healthy, rather than having two meals, a, sorry, rather than having two meals a day like most kids, these parents were feeding them four meals a day and then also feeding them sweet potato, greens and shrimp in their, in their meals. Yeah, so basically the uh, malnutrition ones had the same amount of food essentially, but just rice, but split into two bigger meals. Whereas the ones that were uh, healthier had the same amount of rice but split over four meals. And basically they were saying because they weren't healthy, there was too much food in one big hit that they couldn't digest properly. Whereas the ones that had spread out were able to digest and take in those nutrients, I guess. And they also, as you say, added a little bit of uh, other nutrients from grains and from shrimp and stuff they picked up in the rice paddies. Yeah, love it, man. So yeah, that's the first one. So what's working and how do we do more of it? So ask that rather than say... What's broken and how do we fix it? Yeah, yeah, and basically, yeah, just find what's working and highlight that and use that as a yeah, yeah, as well, a good example. Cool, man. So yeah, the next part of directing the writer is scripting the critical moves. Yeah, and again, this ties into a bit of the decision paralysis paradox of choice in that you know making a decision is a tax on the strength of the writer. So as you said, the rider can only direct the elephant for so long because otherwise he gets tired. Yeah, so the status quo feels comfortable and steady because much of the choice has been squeezed out. So most of the day, the rider is on autopilot. But in in times of change, autopilot doesn't work anymore. Mm. So suddenly, choice is proliferated and autopilot habits become unfamiliar. Yeah. So by scripting the critical moves, you've got to make it as easy as possible for the elephant to to take this new direction. Because the more uncertainty there is, the harder it is going to be for the elephant and the more unlikely the elephant's going to head in that direction. Yeah, spot on. And with that, because we said change brings uncertainty, and with that, there's a greater number of options and there's increased ambiguity, which means there's more decisions that the rider has to make, uh, whereas the elephant likes to just take the default option. Um, And so the way to overcome this inertia of going down the default path and reduce this decision paralysis is present like a crystal clear guidance. And he says you can't script every single move. You can't say, yeah, you can't look down the track and say this is exactly what you have to do with every move. But the critical moves is what you want to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, main point here is clarity <clears throat> dissolves resistance. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And because the writer's always thinking, the issue with the writer is he's always thinking, overanalyzing, whereas you need to just make it clear and snap him out of that analysis and just say, here, do this straight away. Yeah, so the next part of it is pointing to the destination. 
Yeah. And so basically, I like this quote. He says, when you're at the beginning, don't obsess about the middle because when you get to the middle, it's going to look different anyway. So basically, start at the start, point in the right direction, and then, yeah, tweak as you go. He has an example here of Crystal Jones, who was a first grader teacher. Yeah. And uh, so this chick wanted her students to kill it naturally. So yeah. <laughs> you know, she knew she could script the critical moves by creating a great lesson plan and activities and all that. But she needed to show the students where they were heading, which yeah. is pointing to the destination. So the, the tactic Crystal Jones used was by convincing the kids, by the end of this school year, you're going to be third graders. Yeah. So using the, these first graders' languages, these first graders' language was yep. great because the third graders were cooler, smarter, yep. and bigger. So it was like finding that big why for these these kids to 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 uh, adopt the, the critical moves that she's scripting. Yeah, and so they say like send a destination postcard. And as you say, the year ones can see the year threes and see that's the destination we want to get to. Uh, and she even had like a graduation ceremony halfway through and said, cool, you've just graduated first year, now you're in second year. Mm. Um, but the other thing is that, so the destination postcard is this long-term vision. And then, so you have to combine that with the short-term behavioral script for those critical moves. So long-term vision plus short-term scripting the critical moves. Yeah. So yeah, the, the destination postcard show the rider where you're headed and they show why the journey is worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, another critical thing he talks uh, they talk about is the goal needs to be black and white. There can't mm. be any ambiguity in it. Yeah, exactly. Like you might have a New Year's resolution to get healthier, uh, which is so ambiguous. Whereas a black and white might be no chocolate or no wine or go to the gym every day. Yeah. So say for the example you use of, of wine, you might have someone might use the goal of no more than one glass of wine per night, but There'll be a time when your elephant actually really craves the wine, yeah. and then all of a sudden these boundaries get fuzzy. So that yeah. so you'll honour the one glass rule by filling it up to the top, or yeah. you'll call it all of a sudden call it an average. So one yeah. night you'll have seven <laughs> glasses of wine yeah. and get fucked up, and then you'll say, "Oh, I won't have any for the rest of the week," but then yeah. you will. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely will. So yeah, it needs to be no wine ever or no more Cheetos. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, so the next part is motivating the elephant. So as we said, we need to not just focus on this analytical side, but also this emotional side. Mm. And so the first part of motivating the elephant is finding the feeling. Yeah, so he talks here about uh, the difference between negative emotions and positive emotions. So mm. negative emotions tend to have a narrow, uh, narrowing effect on our thoughts. So mm. if you're walking through a dark alley at night, your mind isn't wandering over tomorrow's to-do list. It's very narrow your thought and you can't yep. really think creatively and resourcefully. Yeah. He says if you want to make uh, a quick, immediate change, then use a negative emotion. He calls it like the stone in the shoe. So if you've got a stone in your shoe, you're going to stop immediately, take the stone out. Whereas if you want to make a bigger long-term change, then you use the positive emotions to broaden and build on those feelings. Now, the other thing he liked uh, that I liked, he said, was if the future is clear and there's very little assumptions and you can just focus on the writer and analyze, think, then change... But if it's like a bit fuzzy, it's not clear, you're making a lot of assumptions, then the most effective way is to look at the elephant and see, so allow the elephant to see what change could be and see the issues, feel the change and then make the change. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal, man. Mate, the other yeah. thing I'll... Uh, no, that's all. Yeah, sick. Uh, the next one was shrink the change. So we're still motivating the elephant here, find the feeling. And next is shrink the change. So if you're leading a change effort... You're better off not looking at what's new and different about the change to come. Instead, make an effort to remind people of what has already been conquered. Yeah, and I like the example. So there was a like a coffee place. If you get a stamp card, you know every tenth coffee free or whatever. He said there was they uh, one cafe tried. They gave an eight stamp card, and they gave it to them. And so you need to get eight stamps. And the alternative was they gave a 10 stamp card, but when they gave it to them, they gave them two as a head start. Mm. So both cards needed eight more to get the free one, so it was exactly the same. But on the 10 card, it feels like you're already 20% of the way there. Yeah. So rather than starting from zero, you're already starting from 20% of the way through. Yeah. And so it's like you already have done something. It's good stuff, isn't it? Another one he says, uh, another example he uses is, say, if you're trying to get your kids to do the house cleaning... So you might tell them to focus only on one part of the room or only just five minutes. So it's kind mm. of like we've, we reviewed the book, Mini Habits, and it's mm. essentially 
uh, shrink in the chain so it's so small that subconsciously it, you cannot fail. It's yeah. easy as fuck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that many have it. And the other one is like BJ Fogg, I think his name is, talks about the way to best floss, like take up a flossing habit is to just floss one tooth. Um, but I also like to talk about the placebo effect and how big the placebo effect is in things which are self-reported. Like pain, there's no objective measure of pain. It's just subjective self-reported. So you can take a pill and feel as though your pain's gone down. So that's massive in terms of the elephant. Mm. And also to motivate the elephant to act, we want to lower the bar as much as possible, essentially. He says that starting an unpleasant task is always worse than continuing it. So once you get started, low bar, mini habit, get started, and then it's much easier to, to continue it. Yeah. So the alternative to shrinking the change, if yep. you don't mean more than that, is, yep. uh, is grow your people. So you either make the task so small that you, you cannot fail or... or the other side, grow your people so they can just, just mm. smash it. Yeah, exactly. Build people up, give them the strength to act and enable them to take action and yeah. So one of the biggest parts he talks about here is we're not just born with, an, so it's all about identity. So we're not just born with an identity, we adopt identity throughout our life. So mm. identity is going to play a role in every change situation. Yeah, he talks about the two ways to approach it, the consequence model versus the identity model. The consequence model is... You know, assuming we're all rational people who weigh up, we know all the costs and all the benefits and weigh it up to maximize our satisfaction. Mm. But the identity model is much more realistic in that once we've got an identity, we filter all our decisions through that and think, if I'm like this person, what would someone like this do in this situation? Yep. And so as you say, it doesn't have to be born with, with it. We can take on these identities. We can be given these identities and we act in order to conform with our identity. Yeah. So I'll go a little bit off track here, which is always dangerous, but yeah, an example <laughs> might be, say if someone is, uh, cares for the environment and you're trying to convince them or change them to become vegan, it'll be much easier to, to change someone who already cares for the environment mm. and appeal to that side because it's part of their identity than someone who just doesn't care for the mm. environment. And that came up a lot in um, influence as well, didn't it? A bit yeah. of that foot in the door strategy of, uh, you know, if you can get something to do one small thing and they take on that identity, you can probably get them to do a much bigger thing yeah. that conforms with that identity. So alternative, alternatively, if it's not part of their identity and the answer is no, then you know, you're going to go against their complete self-image. So you're up mm. against a bigger, much yeah. much bigger challenge going against who they already think they are. Mate, one story that I had that I liked was uh, a high school, really dodgy high school, like less than 10% of kids went to on to college after that. And what the... Uh, I think it was a principal or like, you know, the senior teacher, they changed the grades from A, B, C, D, F and they made it A, B, C or N, Y. So there was no fail. They could only get an N, Y, which was not yet. So basically, if you did a task and you got a not yet, you had to redo it until it was an A, B or C. And at the very start of the task, the teacher said, this would be worth an A, this would be worth a B, this would be worth a C. Because in the past, the kids were like, that's fine, we'll just fail, we don't really care. But when failure was not an option, they realized that they had to, you know, yep. get to an A, B, or C. Mate, and this links back into the concept, which is comes up probably the most in all the books we read, and that's that's mindset. Yeah. And having the yeah. growth mindset <laughs> yeah, is uh, so important. Yeah, it popped up again, didn't it? So, yeah, again, it says, if you're going to try and learn something or do something new, and, and he uses what uh, Chip and Dan Heath did, is they tried to learn salsa dancing, which they failed miserably at. <laughs> he says, you can't learn salsa without failing. But mm. because the elephant, it actually really hates to fail. So what you need to create is the expectation of failure. You know, when you go yeah. into something new and uncertainty, you're not going to know everything straight away. So here he talks again about the growth mindset and the importance of it compared to the fixed mindset. Yeah, and he basically they said that you can't, you need to expect to fail. The first time you try anything new, you're not going to be perfect at it. Mm. Um, I also liked he talked uh, a little bit, almost like the dip, saying, you know. Very much growth mindset as well, that anytime you start something new, in the middle, you might feel like a failure, but you need to persist through that valley of angst and doubt and eventually emerge with that growing sense of momentum. Yep. So, yeah, if you haven't read that book yet, it's it's, uh, essentially believing that abilities are like muscles and they're going to build with practice, whereas if you inherently believe things are fixed, the people is born with the skills and, you know, you're not going to learn everything to be able to get through this uncertainty. Yep, nice. And the third part was shape the path and the benefits of shaping the path is saying that you don't need to rely on the logic of the rider you don't need to rely on the emotions of the elephant basically if you make the path 
Mm -hmm. It just follows it without having to rely on any of those. Yeah, so tweaking the environment actually works and and Mm self-manipulation. So an example here would be back to the analogy of trying to wake up earlier to go for a run. Mm. Something as simple as laying out your clothes before you go to sleep is yep. tweaking the environment to make it that little bit easier yep. to be able to, to do what you want to do. Yeah. The other thing that he talked about, a good example I liked in tweaking the environment was like for car crashes, there's interventions you can make in the path rather than the uh, rider or the elephant. And he said there was pre-event uh during the event and after the event and that was like pre-event was things like making the road safer maybe installing bright lights installing stop signs installing roundabouts during the event was things like injury prevention like a uh, airbags and seat belts and then post event would be things like having a uh, efficient effective uh ambulance system basically yeah so there are the three different ways you can shape the path to try and reduce traffic incidences Sick. Next one was building habits. Habits and, big. A lot of habits books we've done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, habits are big. So, yeah, environment, one of the concepts he says, environment shapes habits. So, in, mm. in the Vietnam War, 20% of the soldiers were addicted to drugs and heroin and all the, the hard stuff. But when they got out, you know, the, the government mm. was really worried about they're going to have to support these all these drug addicts. Yeah. But it turned out that only 1% were still mm. addicted when they got out, which is the actual nat- national average yet anyway. Yeah, exactly. They found that when they were in the war, everyone, uh, and in like, you know, Vietnam, a lot of opium, and they were all on it when they were over there because everyone else was. And when they came back, nobody else was. It was frowned upon in society. Mm. And so they got off it. Yeah. Another concept here is rallying the herd. So in ambiguous situations, people naturally look for other people on how to behave. So in chain situations, by definition, these things are unfamiliar. So if we're leading an elephant down an unfamiliar path, it's going to naturally look for what mm. other people are doing and wanting to follow the herd. Yeah, he says it in these un, uh, uncommon, unnatural situations, our social antennae goes up and then we look for guidance from other people. And so there's two stimuli that we need to interpret. Firstly, the event itself and secondly, other people's reactions to the event. Mm. So he says if you're like... Uh, they had an experiment where there was a guy sitting in a room waiting for whatever he's waiting for and he hears a woman fall down the stairs outside and they said 70% of people got up to go and investigate and help out whereas when they had a group in the room waiting for them and they heard someone fall out, nobody else, like the other people were actors and they didn't get up. The person only got up to help like 30% of the time or something. (laughs) So they took guidance from, you know, an unknown situation, they took guidance from what everyone else was doing. Yeah, yeah, it's good, man. Uh, an actionable one here is like, say, if you're managing a company and you want to get everyone's timesheets in on time. So, when the norm is working for you and say 90% of your team are actually submitting it on time, mm-hmm. you use that information to mm. get the 10% up. But if it's the other way around when 90% of the people aren't doing it, you want to avoid yeah. people knowing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, use it in your favor when, it, when people yeah. are adopting the change you want, not the other way around. Yeah, nice. That's pretty much most of it. Yeah, so at the end, it's just a little bit on keeping the switch going. So, uh, yeah, it's not... Man, I like, this, I like this bit at the start. He said, you know, a cliche goes that a long journey starts with a single step. And he said, you know, it's pretty wise, but at the same time, another thing that starts with a single step is an ill-conceived amble that you abandon within a few minutes. <laughs> so, he's, you know, sometimes like, yeah, it could lead to a long journey, but if you take a single step, you need to recognize it, celebrate it, and reinforce that positive behavior to keep going and take the next step, keep that switch going. Yeah, so at the start, inertia is a formidable opponent mm. and at some point, this inertia will shift from resisting change to supporting it and small changes begin to snowball into big changes, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Good shit. Uh, is that everything for you? Yeah, man. Man, I thought this, again, I thought this was a bloody good book. I really like the structure of, you know, direct, give the writer clear directions, motivate the elephant, shape the path. You know, yeah. It's phenomenal, man. This should be taught in high school. <laughs> yeah, this is... It's, mate, I really like, mate, I really this, like this book. This should be taught to everyone. Yeah. Like, it's so important, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Fucking switch. Switch it up. Like switch your own. Will Smith. Switch. Let's make some change. Chip and Dan Heath. Chip and Dan Heath doing salsa to dance and it's hard. It's hard. How are we going to change this? Why not dance?
Firstly, let's direct the data. That's the rational, analytical side of your brain. Find those bots by script the critical moves and point to your destination. Hey, on, elephant today, we're going on the road through the jungle. Oh, 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 in Africa, we're going to the road the jungle. Oh. Find that feeling and trying to change or grow your people and motivate the emotional elephant. How we gonna move? Got a script to create a good move. So what to do? What to do? Shape that path. Tweak the environment. Build those habits and rally the herd. Yeah, yeah. Don't get pussy. <laughs> get that elephant pussy. Big old flappy flappy pussy on the elephant. Oh, oh, oh. that's a big flappy pussy. <laughs> Stick that chunk up the pussy. <laughs> <laughs>